Hey, everybody. Welcome to our 12th. I think this is number 12 of the Apologetic series. We've answered 12 different questions. Um, we've done all kinds of things. How about everybody says, um, says hello to the camera today? Hi. Hello to the camera today. Okay. Sup, dogs? No. How's it going? <laughs> hello. So we've got Aiden on here, and Emma, and Ellie, and Logan, and Bradley, and Gabe, and Andy, and Addison, and Livy. Welcome to all you wonderful cats and kittens. Um, we're going to get started today with our question. This question came up from you guys um, recently. And the question is, did God make all the different languages? And where did the languages come from? And uh, something I'd like to answer today and try to figure out is, does the biblical story, does the biblical perspective on where the languages come from fit with like what linguists, people who study languages um, and stuff like that, where language came from? Are these compatible stories? Um, there's really just one spot in the Bible that talks about where the languages came from. And that's the story of the Tower of Babel, we usually say. I, I, I learned in researching this that it's more correctly pronounced ba or Babel, but I usually say Babel. Um, it's interesting, the Tower of Babel um, actually means kind of blah, 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 like all the languages, blah, blah, blah. Um, in Hebrew, that's kind of a play on words for, for what Babel, where Babel comes from, and it kind of does that in English too, like babbling on. Um, but we're going to look at that story today um, in Genesis um, about the Tower of Babel, Babel, where all the languages, where God divided all the languages. And then we're going to talk about what um, that means for, um, for, for us today, about our languages today, and then try to answer some of the questions about um, if that fits with um, the theories on where, where science or linguists would tell us biblical or ling languages came from and that kind of stuff. So it's kind of interesting today. I thought it wouldn't be as interesting as, as, as it turned out to be. I kind of thought about not doing this one because I was like, it's just the story in the Bible where the languages came from, but it's actually kind of interesting. Um, I appreciate if you guys take down notes. Um, Ellie did this beautiful board for us, and um, this will help you write the stuff down. I'd like you to write down most of this stuff. So first of all, our question for today, our apologetics question, which is apologetics means defending the faith. Um, did God make all the different languages? That's our question for today, our question that we're going to defend from the biblical perspective and also look at the science and other theories out there. So we first, we always start with defining our terms to make sure we know what we're talking about. So when we talk about language, our first term is language. Um, we're talking about the method of human communication, our speech, you know? either spoken or written, right? It can be spoken or written. Some, some languages only exist spoken. They don't have a written language yet. And especially as you go way back in history, um, the languages seem to have been spoken, but it took longer for them to be written and have a form of writing. Consisting of the use of words in structured and conventional, in a conventional way. So defining a language is not just randomness, but there's a system there to be able to call it a language. Um, and then also we talk about language as a system of communication by a particular country or community. So languages are actually something that groups people together, like even beyond like race or skin color um, or, or like geographic places, languages are actually a uniting factor for peoples a lot of the time, um, especially when um, there were less technology to help us translate, uh, languages would divide because if you can't communicate with somebody, it's really hard to work with them. It's really hard to get anything done. Um, and then finally, for our terms, the number of languages in the world today, I found different numbers out there. This is the highest number, so I went with it because they had the biggest list. I think we are continuing to discover languages or define languages as different because there's different dialects and languages can be similar, but they then they can define them as a different language because they're different dialects. 
I'm not sure how deep it went into dialects or how it defined, but up to 7,000 languages in the world today, um, maybe more. So that's a lot of different languages. And that pertains to our question too about the biblical passage of the Tower of Babel that we're going to read next. Did all those languages come at that moment or have they evolved over time? So there's some of our terms and then uh, our challenges. So we always start with our challenges to this question because um, we believe the Bible is true, but we like to, to discover why. And that's what apologetics seeks to do is defend the truth. So here's some of the challenges to this question. If we were to answer yes to this question, that like yes, God made all the different languages. First of all, this story out of many others just seems like a convenient little story um, that you could say, well, isn't that nice that your Bible has a reason for why we have so many languages? Just a, God did it. He decided to make all the languages one day. It kind of seems convenient for just as a, if the Bible wasn't true, just a reason to explain where all the languages came from. Um, another challenge for it is in the timeline of when this happened. So after the flood, um, would there have been enough people to have 7,000 people groups for all these different languages? Um, I, I would say no, there's, there wouldn't have been enough people. D depending on the timeline, there's different ways to place this in time. Um, but it was only a few hundred years after the flood. So you had Noah and his three sons. And then um, a few more generations later, and you had the Tower of Babel. So I don't think there would have been enough, there wouldn't have been 7,000 people groups there. So this, could, this story could come under attack because there wasn't enough people for 7,000 languages. Um, and then I just want to know, is there a linguistic evidence as people who study languages? Because they, could they see that there's evidence for this happening when they study language today? Um, and do they do they realize do they find that there used to be one common language and then it was split into many is there evidence for that and then as we get into the story there's some funny interesting challenges to think about like they got in trouble for building this tower so i'm getting ahead of myself i we haven't read the story yet but is it wrong to build towers today and then is it wrong to travel to space today because they says they wanted to reach up to the heavens so is it wrong to travel to space and then this one I, th I found really funny is google translate undoing god's judgment because it's undoing these language barriers and by technology are we undoing what god has set in place to divide us and so much of the internet has started to really break down language barriers and as the world has become more on the internet English has risen to the top as one main language, and um, all the translation tools have really a lot of part in a lot of ways for online text. You just click a button, uh, like on Facebook, and you translate it, and then whatever they wrote in French is now in English for you. So the language barriers are becoming less of an issue. So I'm going to unmute you guys. I want to hear like, do you do you agree with some of these challenges? Are any of them funny to you? Um, does it does it make sense? And then we're going to read Genesis. What are your thoughts? Um, honestly, I have thought of a lot of those before, like the tower one and the space one. Like I've like reading that story like in high school as a little kid. I was like, why why do we build towers now? Like that's like that's something that I've, I've thought before. So I thought that was cool. Nice. Yeah, I've had the same thoughts um do you guys think what do you guys think if you want to make some predictions here is google translate wrong again is it google translate against the bible is space travel against yes. the bible what do yes. you think yes yes badly says yes <laughs> we should not no. be no aiden says no to space travel or google translate uh, no i don't think so okay um i agree okay we will fi we'll find out though um let's first let's look at the bible get it, get your bible open um could i have someone this is going to be the main text of the story of the tower of babel ellie i see your hand you can read genesis 11 1 through 9 I'll, i'm going to write i'm going to sign all these and then i'll write who got them who wants to read logan genesis? i think i have a bible in our closet genesis 9 1 olivia 
We only have four today. Who wants to read Acts 2, 5 to 12? Thank you. Gabe. And who wants to read Philippians 2, 10? I got it. Aiden. Perfect. Okay. Let's start then with Ellie reading... Reading Genesis 11, 1 to 9. Okay. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city in a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, there are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will, to do will become impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building this city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of the entire earth. Thank you, Ellie. So there, we have our main text of where the Bible says languages came from. The people, these were, okay, this is after the flood, by the way. Um, there's, there's quite a few people now, depending on how you track the time, a few hundred years maybe after the flood, a few generations, multiple generations later. And they decide to go and build this city and build this high tower to heaven and make a name for themselves. Now, it doesn't seem that bad for God to like totally wreck their plans, but I want to look at the, the other passage that Olivia has because it has the reason why, the main reason why this is a problem. Olivia, could you read Genesis 9 verse 1? Then, the, then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase the number and fill the earth. So the command to the people, to Noah and his sons, was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So the first thing that the people were doing wrong in building this city and building this tower, it says they were doing it on purpose that they wouldn't be scattered, is that they, they built the city so that they wouldn't fill the earth. So they're disobeying God's command to go be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. God's design, God's plan for his people was to fill the earth with humans and to go everywhere and have humankind spread out, not just in one place. Um, now the other part, so, so that was a disobedience to God's command. The other part that's less clear is, um, and this is from studying the word that they use for tower to heaven, is very similar to, and this is what, like if you look up pictures of what the Tower of Babel would have looked like, um, it was kind of like a pyramid with steps in it kind of tower, if you imagine that, um, is that it was very similar to what the Babylonians ended up building, which were temples of worship to like the, the heaven gods, like so like the, the planets and the sun, moon and stars. So it very easily could have been connected. It's not explicit in the text that it was related to idol worship. Um, but clearly, even, even if it wasn't that, it was related to glorifying themselves rather than God. And so it was some form of idol worship for sure, whether that was specific, um, like heavenly deity, like God, the sun God, the moon God, the Saturn God, the, the Venus God, all the planets, or if it was just a temple basically to themselves, like look at how great we are. It was it was glorifying themselves rather than God. And that much is clear to me. Um, so that was the two main problems is that they were disobeying God's command to fill the earth. And it was some form of idolatry that they were choosing to worship and bring glory to themselves rather than God or worship idols. Um, so, so 
those are the reasons that God had a problem with this. Um, you know, like if, if we get people together and have a building project, like in the glorious to God, like God wouldn't have a problem with that. But if the glorious to ourselves, that's self-worship. And if we're trying to make a name for ourselves and, and, and make ourselves great, then that's not what God wants us doing as Christians. So those are the reasons God had a problem with that. And he stepped in to stop it. And he didn't step in to stop mankind like he did just a few hundred years earlier with the flood. I mean, back then, I think it was worse. Um, people were violent all the time. Um, all they had was violence in their heart and hatred toward one another. And so God destroyed the world with the flood. And then he promised not to do that ever again, as you know, with the rainbow is the signal of God's promise that he would never destroy the whole earth with the flood. So God wasn't about to come in here and destroy them, but he did divide them. He stopped what they were doing by confusing their language, confusing their speech, making them speak a bunch of different languages. And thus they clustered up in separate people groups and spread over the earth. So they, they were kind of forced into doing what God had asked them to do, starting when he told Noah and his family what to do. They were, they were separated by language and then went over the, the whole earth um, because they couldn't communicate. They couldn't work together. They couldn't live together when you can't communicate and you're just confused. So you naturally would cluster to the people that you can communicate with. So um, God doesn't destroy them, but he does spread them out over the earth and he does cause them to disperse. Um, I want to hear from you guys. Why do you, does that make sense? Why do you guys think God would have stopped this building? Um, does it make sense? Are you having any other ideas why God might have wanted to stop what they were doing here? Yeah, it, it actually, when, when you break it down like that, it seems like a really smart plan. It's not just, oh, that's the convenient, you know, throw in, like with the challenges that we had. Right, so it makes you're saying it makes sense that it's not just oh a, a convenient story to explain why we have a bunch of languages. There was a reason and purpose behind it. Yeah, I would agree. Any other thoughts? Okay, so continuing on, um, I don't have a lot of research for you, um, but. I did watch a bunch of videos about linguistics and language, and it was really interesting how the most linguists do point to many different language or to one kind of common language and how language evolves over time. Um, and I did find it um, not perfect, a perfect fit. Like, yeah, we noticed in all the historical record that at one point in um, you know 3000 BC that all these languages came on the scene all at once. There's not, there's not perfect evidence for it, but when, you, when the linguists do study language, they are, are very clear that we have 7,000 languages today that haven't been around for thousands of years. Like, it's not like all these languages have been around. And so this, so this problem where did God create 7,000 languages at the Tower of Babel the historical record wouldn't try to force that issue. All these languages are more modern. And, you know, there's, there's two interesting questions here is one is what is the original language that they were speaking when they were building the tower? Can we figure that out? And then what languages did God divide them into? So I don't think we'll ever know either of those questions for sure, because, you know, there, there isn't writings from back then. It's possible, like, we could discover older and older writings, and, and maybe we'll know someday, because we might discover something that would show us what that original language is or was. But at this point, we don't know what it was. Um, different, um, different linguists call it, um, what, what do they call it? Proto-world proto language is kind of the name they give that language. Um, but generally, they, they linguists would say that originally mankind had just one language. There's evidence for that. And then at some point, like they try to connect all, the, like languages are connected. If you've learned any Spanish, you'll, you'll notice that some words in English sound like the Spanish words. There's a term for that, I can't remember. 
but like across a lot of languages, there's language similarities. And that's because English specifically is not an old, old language. English is a language that is derived from lots of different languages. It comes from some Greek, it comes from some Sanskrit, it comes from some Latin, it comes from like has Germanic, German roots. Um, English is not an incredibly like um, tens of thousands of years or, or like, you know, multiple thousands years language, old language. It's a fairly modern, like a couple thousand year old language. Um, not a really old language because it draws from other ones. It's kind of like like a family tree, like a, a language evolves over the time. Like if you've read a new King, uh, King James Version Bible from the 1600s, you know they use different words than we use now. Language changes over the time, um, also to the point where it can become a new language. And so when they trace it back, they kind of have, um, and we're going to watch a video about this, about 70 or so original families of languages from about this time in the Tower of Babel that all the languages that we have today can trace their roots to. So maybe it's about 90 or something. It's, it's less than 100 um, original kind of family languages that a lot of our languages kind of, we can narrow it down to under 100 languages that are the, the original languages of all the languages we have today which that number is way more feasible to think about with how many people groups God may have created or how many languages he would have divided them into than the number 7,000. Less than 190 or 70 or something really fits with how many even people groups we see in the, in the genealogies that follow this story. So if we're under 100 languages, it's very possible that that is enough people to be using those languages rather than 7,000. If it was 7,000 languages, it would be really hard to say, yeah, the Bible's true here because there wouldn't have been enough people for there to be 7,000 languages back then. But we know that these 7,000 languages you have today didn't need to exist back then. Only about 100 or less than 100, which, which fits. Um, so I thought that was really cool from the linguistic perspective. I mean. I didn't really find videos of, of linguists who are like, yes, it's very clear that there was one language and all of a sudden a bunch exploded onto the historical scene. But there is some similarities to the biblical story in the language, in the history of languages that helps us. And one thing I wanna to note too, if you stick to the Bible's timeline of, of humanity um, and the different challenges with that, we've talked over some of those things, but if we add up the generations of people, we get about, a 6,000 year ago Adam, um, it, it might be hard to see 7,000 languages evolving from one language in that time. But if we have God doing a miracle and creating a bunch of languages at one time, kind of kickstarting language, it is possible for us to go from less than 100 languages to 7,000 in, in the time that the Bible has. Um, so I found it Interestingly enough, there's a lot of information out there, but I think it works. I think it works together where we have linguists saying, yes, we do see, we, we try to figure out the, the original language, but we don't know what it is. But they kind of would identify that, yeah, at one time there was just one language, um, or, and then, there'd be, then there was families of languages, and here's the 90 families of languages that we see that the language we have today came from. So I don't know, I, don't, I see that it fits with the biblical account. It's not a perfect fit, but I do see that it fits. I wanna play this video from Answers in Genesis, which is Ken Ham guy, the guy who has the big arc. And um, he, they're asking the question about Tower of Babel. So this is about a three minute video and check it out. Was the dispersion at Babel a real event? 
Well, the first thing you should do is establish that the Bible is the authority. Uh, once you've established that the Bible is the authority, that's when you can dive into the scriptures and take a look and see what the Bible is actually talking about when it talks about the Tower of Babel, or more appropriately, Babel, uh, as the Hebrew tongue would put it. Uh, one of the things that I would do is dispel one of the myths right off the bat. Uh, some people have said, well, hold on a second here. You know, why is God being so mean that he would come down and he would judge these innocent people uh, and, and confuse their languages? Well, if you jump back to Genesis 9-1, when Noah and his family first came off the ark, uh, the Lord blessed Noah and his sons and, and, and their families. And he said, hey, spread out and fill the earth. What happened at the Tower of Babel, if you jump to Genesis chapter 11, uh, verse 4, it says that they said, hey, we don't want to be scattered. So they came together and they wanted to build a tower so they wouldn't be spread out about the earth and to fill the earth. So what happens when you defy the Lord? Well, he comes down and he steps in. Uh, so the Lord wasn't being an ogre in that sense. What he was doing is he was stepping in to fulfill what should have been done. Another thing you can do is you can explain when the Tower of Babel was. Now, the scripture is not straightforward when the Tower of Babel was, but if we look at some of the chronologists, for example, uh, Archbishop James Usher, who is one of the most popular chronologists, he did his chronology in the 1600s, and uh, he even uh, had, had his dates appear in the King James Bible for several hundred years. He places the Tower of Babel 106 years after the flood. Uh, it, by our uh, common dating system, that would have been about 2242 BC. Now, whether that's accurate or not, I'm not uh, exactly certain, but let's just assume for a moment that that was correct. Now, as soon as we would assume that, some people say, hold on a second, Bodhi, what about all those languages? There's somewhere in the neighborhood of just under 7,000 languages in the world today. Are you saying that eight people came off the ark and in 106 years there was about 7,000 languages? Well, no, 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 I'm not saying that at all. Actually, linguists and people who've studied these languages, what they've done is they've looked at them and they've grouped them into language families. Uh, for example, the Latin-based language family has uh, Italian, it has Romanian, it has French, it has uh, Spanish, it even has some English in there as well. Well, of course, English also has a Germanic root, uh, which is why it's a little bit different than some of these other languages. But what they've done is they've taken these various languages and they've narrowed it down to no more than 94 language families. Now, to me, that was exciting because if you look at Genesis chapter 10 and you add up all the various uh, families that came out of there with the new language, you get no less than 78. There's actually more than that. We're just not certain exactly how many there were. Uh, so at that point, hey, that's a great confirmation of what the scriptures are really teaching. Now, this is just a tip of the iceberg. I want to encourage you to take a look at the New Answers book, volume two. There's a chapter specifically on the Tower of Babel. Uh, indicating that it is a real event. I want to encourage you to take a look at that and uh, find out a little bit more. All right, so that's a lot of repeat on, on what, we, what we talked about, but yeah, similar ideas to it being possible and it being... Um, Fit, fit how it fits into what we know about language and what linguists say about the evolution of language. Um, it really kind of is an evolution if we, we, how language grows and, and over time, it's, we, we can see that even over how, the different slang words we use, how that changes language and all the things. I don't understand what you guys are talking about half the time. Um, we're going to read the other two verses because I want to answer some of these other questions. And um, I want to also show one cool piece of how I, I think God is, uh, has undone um, this curse, I guess, if it's a curse or this, what he's done to the people. And, and I want to go to Acts. Gabe has Acts for us. And uh, go ahead and read Acts 2, 5 to 12. And let's see, note what God is doing with language in this story, okay? Right. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each, heard, each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Uh, Parthians, Medes, uh, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia. Um, Egypt and the parts of Libya near 
Cyrene visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cratians and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in their own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Nice. So I'm glad you read that list and not me, Gabe. Um, good job <laughs> pronouncing all those people groups. What did you guys notice that God did to languages in this story? Even though they're speaking one language, everyone can hear it in their own tongue. Yeah. So this is an interesting undoing of the Tower of Babel in some ways, that there was no longer a language barrier in this moment. And the Holy Spirit overcame the language barrier and allowed the, the good news of Jesus to be shared in every language. I think that's awesome. And in some ways, um, I'm drawing from this that that god the gospel what jesus has done is also undoing because he is what he did on the cross undoes the curse of sin also in some ways undoes the curse of of the languages the curse of the tower of babel of the dividing by languages and that's through through tongues and the holy spirit being able to communicate through a different language that you don't know and i think that's super awesome and that the that the holy spirit undoes what the Tower of Babel did in this moment and continued to do with um, overcoming language barriers. It's really incredible. Um, one more verse, Philippians 2.10. Addison, you had that, right? No, Aiden did. That's what it was. I, I wrote an A, but Aiden just left. Does someone else want to grab? Oh, Aiden, do you have Philippians 2.10? You are muted. Okay, 2.10 what? Philippians 2.10? Just the one verse. Okay. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Perfect. Um, so, oh, wait. Um, mine says, yeah. Oh, and verse 11 too. I'm sorry. I forgot 11 was necessary. Can you read 11 as well? Okay. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Perfect. So what we see here is that every nation and then every tongue, which is pertinent to what we're talking about, every tongue, every language is going to someday declare that Jesus is Lord, which is just an awesome thing to think about. Of all the languages, there will be together declaring that Jesus is Lord, which is just going to be the most awesome thing to hear ever. But it's also another showing of the undoing of the, the, the boundaries and the, the challenges of multiple languages is that in one voice, all people will someday declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, every tongue, every tribe, every nation. So all the divisions that have come about um, from the Babel curse um, or the Babel judgment, depending on how you want to say it, are being undone first by the Holy Spirit by the gospel and eventually it will be completely undone uh, together i think in a tongue i don't know is there going to be multiple languages in heaven i don't think there's going to be a language barrier in heaven so i believe we're working towards the undoing of babel curse of the ma many languages so that brings us to some of these other questions like um, you know, Google Translate, is it wrong to use Google Translate because it undoes this curse that God has put on us to divide us? And I think based on we are New Testament believers, we have the gospel, like what, what God did with the people in the Old Testament, like we talked, we've connected to what we've been talking about with the Jews and the people of, people of Israel, that no longer is it divided, is God only the people of the Jews, only the God of the, of the the chosen people. He is the God of all people. The gospel is available to all people. So when we have technology that I believe God has given us and or allowed us to uh, come up with by the brains he gave us um, to help translate language, to go and translate the Bible into many different languages, to do all these things, to use the tools like computers at our disposal to help us communicate. Think about how that can use, be used for the gospel. I mean, when we go on Mexico mission trips, I have Google Translate open all the time, and I'm using it to communicate for the hope of sharing God's love with people. That's why we're down there. 
So no, I don't think that God would be upset with us using Google Translate. Um, it's a tool that God has given us. It Yes, it undoes some of the language barriers, but that's a good thing. And that can allow the gospel to be shared. Um, now to the other the other things like wrong to build towers today like we saw in the story like they got in trouble for building a tower so we have all these skyscrapers and cities too which is part of what they did cities um so at this point the earth is pretty well settled like even like we we live in areas that normally you'd never be able to live like gabe and andy live in a desert like <laughs> unless they had water pipes that the technology of water pipes, they would not be able to live there normally. They'd have to live near a water source. So I think we've pretty well at this point in human history settled the earth spread out. So I don't think there's any problem with that. There's certain areas that are more dense, but that I think that's a necessary thing like cities. And that, that comes with tall towers. Now, I think the principle that we talked about about idolatry or bringing, giving credit to ourselves is an interesting one. Like if we build a giant tower for, if I build this huge tower, the Brian Stewart Tower, and this is going to sound like I have something to say about Trump because of the Trump Tower or something. But if I build things to bring glory to myself and to, to try to make people worship me or, or love me or somehow bring fame to my name, if that's the reason I'm doing it then I believe that would be wrong to try to bring glory to myself rather than pointing glory to God. It'd kind of be a principle of anything, like anything we do shouldn't be to bring glory and fame to ourselves, but to point the glory to God. So towers would fall in the, that same category of who am I trying to recognize? Who am I trying to make great by doing this? Am I trying to make uh, the Brian Stewart name great or am I trying to make God great? So if I'm trying to build a, a tower that has housing or offices for people to be able to live and work, like that's a purpose. I'm doing it for other people, maybe not myself. So, you know, if you're in that position to build a tower and you have a choice to put your name on it or not, that's, that's something that you can take up with God about whose name should be on the building. But anything we do to bring ourselves glory to, to really to worship ourselves is idolatry. So not specifically a tower. I don't see specifically cities coming under judgment here, but mainly the trying to bring credit to themselves and the disobeying of God's command to fill the earth, which I think we've done. Um, as far as reaching the heavens, like the, the tower was supposed to try to do, and space exploration, is it wrong to travel to space today? I want to hear from you guys. Is it wrong to travel to space today because the Tower of Babel people were trying to reach the heavens? What do you think? No. I don't think so, no. No. There's a bee in my room. I'm sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> freaking me out. Any other thoughts on the space travel stuff? I guess, like, it's for, like, the wrong reasons, not, like, just like I said, like, please, 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 glorify, please. like, you, I guess it's wrong. Okay. But I mean, we went to I space, know. you know, the space, the moon race was definitely like, can we beat Russia, get America's flag on the moon? I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of a funny thing to think about. But yeah, no, generally, I don't think space travel is this um, big thing to, like, bring glory to ourselves. I think it's kind of like for the good of mankind to explore and... I don't know if you can go as far as God says to spread out all over the earth. Can we spread out all over the, the galaxy too? I don't know. I don't know if we want to apply that command from God that we need to spread out to other planets. But um, yeah, I don't think there's a problem with, with uh, space exploration because I think space is cool and getting up into space is neat. But I think if we do, if we do it to defy God, like they kind of were like to make themselves God, like, then um, I think, it'd, yeah, like you said, Ellie, it'd fall under the same reasons of your motivations, your heart, and why are you doing this? Um, are, you going, are you going to space to prove God doesn't exist? Is that your reason? To be like, look, I went up to space. God wasn't up there. I went to heaven. God wasn't there. Um, but heaven is not a physical place we can travel to. But like, if that's your purpose for space travel, then yeah. I don't think space travel would be a good idea for you, but generally not, not applying this passage to saying that space travel is wrong. Um, so yeah, 
I think some of those challenges, as far as it, you know, going back to seeming convenient, I think that's the truth might be convenient, right? <laughs> like, why do we have a bunch of languages? Well, God made it that way. And so sometimes as much as I, I don't want to, I like to have evidence for my faith. Sometimes it just does take faith to believe that's how God intended it and that's how he did it. And it's not a great story because there's not a lot of details, but um, I think I, I'll take it because I believe the Bible and it's my authority that, and it also, it, I really appreciate that it fits with linguistics that I can believe that it's true. Um, and then, yeah, we, we've answered the other ones about there being enough people and stuff like that. So the short answer and why. Again, the, my, my short answers are never that short, but we'll, we'll try here. So write this down, please. Our short answer to this, this question, why did God make all the different languages? Um, he did it because God divided the people with languages to keep them from evil. So God was preventing evil by dividing them with languages. So if you want to write down, God divided the people with languages to keep them from evil. And then new languages have continued to form and change over time. So, you know, like we talked about, English was not an old, old language. It's come out of other languages that we know about. We see how it's all connected and language continues to evolve and continues to change. And every generation brings its own new words. And then eventually it, it breaks off, you know, and, and maybe not as many new languages are being formed today because we're centralized in communication. Maybe new languages won't form. Maybe we'll start to see a decrease in languages as languages die and more people use, you know, the internet. Um, but language definitely changes over time. Um, and now, yeah, with the more written forms, language becomes more set. But if you don't have written language, language is very fluid. It changes very fast and and it gets adapted like because imagine those languages back then didn't have dictionaries to define the meanings of words and so the meaning of words could change all the time and then a family would move over here and they would use their own words and never communicate with them over here and then a new language would be born so it, it happened much quicker back then um, new languages have continued to form and change over time and then finally god reunites the divide with the gospel for every nation and tongue so god God reunites, he, or, or you can say he undoes the divide of the Tower of Babel with the gospel, that it brings healing to this curse as well as he has, we see him bring other healing to the divide between us and God, needing to do sacrifice. We have Jesus. Um, God is bringing healing to the divide of languages um, and with the gospel for every nation and tongue. And finally, that's the ultimate goal. I think in heaven, we're going to have one language again that would be awesome um the linguistic evidence also supports the story is the final thing the linguistic evidence also supports the story is what we talked about with all the language families and the language trees and all that so that is our answer to the the tower of babel story where languages came from we didn't talk much about the original language and what it was Honestly, there wasn't good evidence for it. A lot of Jews like to say it was Hebrew. Um, other people like to say it was different languages. I will, I will leave you with this one piece of evidence I found. The oldest root languages in the world that we know of is one that's like a Chinese-related root language is Tamil. I think that's, they say that's the oldest, oldest language or South Indian language it's an asian language i guess maybe not chinese um, but that's the one they have some oldest pieces of writing for that's why they believe it's the oldest sanskrit is a really old language greek is a really old language latin and hebrew and arabic and chinese and egyptian and persian and sumerian all those are really old languages and really either one of those probably is the oldest language that they were all speaking or who knows it doesn't say god could have just um wiped out the original language and maybe the original language didn't exist as soon as god changed everyone's language at the tower of babel we don't know there's not good evidence and maybe that's why is that it doesn't didn't doesn't exist anymore and there's no evidence for it but um maybe someday we'll figure out what that original language was if we find some really old tablets or something um i wouldn't be surprised if we did that would be really interesting 
Anyway, thanks for joining us for another apologetics question. And um, I hope you learned something today.